Well, hello everyone, and welcome again to the New Human Movement. So glad you're joining us. Uh, a fantastic guest today and a really good friend for a very long time. And that's Professor Linda Grattan of the London Business School. Uh, Linda is a professor of management practice. Uh, I've known her since we were young faculty, disrupting faculty meetings, sitting in the back row, uh, but has had an, an illustrious career at the London Business School, uh, has probably deeper knowledge about HR and the intersection between people and work and organizations than anybody I know. Linda teaches a future of work elective at the business school. For years, she's run a consortia of companies of HR leaders from around the world, 90 companies who are working together to imagine the future of work. Uh, her books have been translated uh, into many languages. Uh, I would highly recommend Hotspots, uh, Shift, uh, 100 Year Life. And we're here today to talk a bit about Linda's uh, most recent book, uh, Redesigning Work. So Linda, thanks so much for joining us. Lovely to see you. Well, lovely to see you, Gary. So let's let's dig in and and kind of start with the, the, the kind of the very first premise of, of your book, your, your latest book. And and you say that we're experiencing like the greatest global shift in work in a century. And I'm sure for many people it it feels that way, that thanks to the pandemic, we've had like the biggest unplanned experiment in the history of, of work. Uh, and maybe you can just start, you know, it's, it's so hard to separate out like the noise and all of this and all the rhetoric. I mean, obviously, every, every magazine for the last two years you've picked up talks about remote work. So what's like really happening? What are the big trends here? And, and maybe what's the noise? Start by just giving us your take on, on what's really happening. Well, well, Gary, um, what's really happening is changing almost from day to day. I, I don't know if I ever told you, Gary, that I kept a journal now in volume 13. So I kept a journal from March the 24th, 2020, because that was the day we, we locked down in London. And I actually, I, as you know, I co-chair the World Economic Forum Council on Skills and Jobs. And we actually had our council meeting that day. And I took, I took a, I've taken, I took, took a, I started a journal then. I'm still writing it. Um, and it's been an evolving, I, I think what I'd really say, Gary, Gary, is it's an evolving story with some things that are sort of predictable and then other things that are really rather unpredictable. So, for example, unpredictable, well, if I go back to my notes at the beginning, we thought that everyone would be back by September. Now, they didn't mean September this year. They meant September 2020. So, you know, we didn't get that right. Honestly, we didn't predict that would be, there would be the great resignation. We actually thought there would be huge job loss. And, but we did see within a week, and you, you know, I wrote the H Harvard Business Review article in March 2021 about hybrid, and, and I led in that article with Fujitsu. And, and you and I know Japan very well. The reason I chose Fujitsu as my opening story was, you know, here was a country which had for, for, for decades said, we cannot change the way we work. You know, we, we, we just can't. If we change anything, then the whole edifice will fall apart. People have got to be in the office. They've got to be there for 10 hours a day. And of course, in that week, Fujitsu said 60,000 people moved out of the office into their home. And that was an extraordinary thing to happen. But what they also learned along the way is that productivity didn't completely collapse. And in fact, in some of the companies we looked at, productivity actually increased. Why did it increase? Well, Gary, I'd be interested in your view, but honestly, my perspective is that the unsung hero in all of this is technology. I don't think this would have happened anything like that if it was 10 years ago. But the fact that we could move so quickly onto platforms with so much ease and at such low cost, I think that really it helped us to use technology to, to get rid of a lot of bureaucracy. I remember talking very early on to one of the senior executives at British Telecom, the, you know, the UK telecoms company. She said, you know, we have just thrown bureaucracy out of the window. I know, Gary, you would love, you would love that phrase. Because she said, suddenly we realized, why are we working like this? So that's why, speaking as a 67-year-old, uh, this, I have never seen anything like it. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, Gary, is that 
I don't want us to go back to how we were. It would be an incredibly sad thing if everybody just went back to how we were before. What a lost opportunity. You know, one, one thing on that point, Linda, and, and Michaela and I have, have made this argument. You know, if you look back over long periods of history, like organizational innovation, innovation in work and management has always lagged technology innovation. You know, often by decades, sometimes by generations. And, and it seems so, like, it wasn't, it wasn't that, like, anybody invented new technology here. It was ready to go. It was already there, right? But, but it, it seems like the crisis suddenly made us take it seriously and, and explore its potential. Uh, but it wasn't, I mean, the technology had been evolving in this way for some long time. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And, and in fact, people have been playing around with it. You know, I follow a couple of uh, tech, tech companies pretty closely, and they had begun to use some of these technologies. I remember being in with Tata Consulting Services, and, and they had a great big screen, you know, and we were interacting. But that, honestly, Gary, that cost a fortune. That cost as much as me flying out to Mumbai. So I think it wasn't just the technology was there. It also had come right down in price, which meant that anyone could use it any of the time. And, and I think, you know, if we had said to organizations, as you and I have said for years, for goodness sake, why can't we experiment more? They would have said, oh, well, I'll just run a private pilot and da-da-da. But actually, what was astounding about this, and, and you'll see in the book that I talk about this, this Lewin, uh, Kurt Lewin concept of freeze, unfreeze, refreeze. It wasn't just that a few organizations unfroze. What I think was so astounding is every single company unfroze and they did it simultaneously and so there's been an enormous amount of experimentation and for people like you and I it's been just an incredible journey to see what's going on. Yeah it's kind of like this amazing accelerated evolution things that experiments that might have happened over years and years and years you're absolutely right Every, everybody had to do it. Now when you talk when you talk to, to CEOs Linda and you talk to you know heads of HR what what surprised them as 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 you know what you you mentioned one thing that at Fujitsu you know they thought like productivity would tank and it didn't but what are the and and we have a few observations we might share there as well from from our conversations but what has surprised leaders uh, as this happened I, I think you know one of the the surprises that have has sort of built up over time I mean quite early on I, I've been running webinars right the way from the beginning so I used mentee and so on to ask people how are you feeling I did a webinar for London Business School um, on the, I think the end of March 2020 and I said you know how are you feeling and people at that stage said well oh, it's astounding the technology is holding up really well but a, quite a number of people said I'm feeling a bit lonely. And I think, you know, we began to think a lot more about human connectivity, about social capital, about networks. And that's that's actually why in, in redesigning work, I, 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 I write quite a lot about networks because it seems to me that we've ha we've begun to realize just how important networks are, both, you know, to allow us to uh, spend time with people who who have the same knowledge as as, our, as we have but also you know the sort of people that we can bounce ideas off who are very different from us those sort of diverse weak ties that you know sociologists talk about and those began very quickly to break down so very quickly people spent more time with people just like them and less time with diversity and then that sort of so, so, into so, a so my Sorry. what you think is my connection shrank right there were the people on my zoom yeah. call the people on yeah. my work team but i wasn't yeah. okay yeah so those strong you know people that we know already but what what went were the sort of broad uh, networks of people you don't know so well and then and then one of the conversations which is still very much ongoing is well what was the office for? You know, well, why did we go into the office? And people started, I think, to early on to imagine that the office was this astounding place that, you know, when you went into the office, you know, you you met people all the time, the water cooler conversations. Of course, we know that was nonsense. We know that actually data from before COVID shows when people went into the office, especially if it was open plan, it was so noisy, they put on their uh, headphones and they worked on their computer. So, you know, there's a bit of reality going in now. I, I spoke to somebody uh, from one of the big investment banks a few days ago, based in New York, and she said to me, you know, Linda, 
I have just spent one and a half hours coming into this office because I, you know, I live, I work in New York and I live outside and I'm going to spend one and a half hours going back. I have sat the whole time in my office on Zoom meetings. You have to say, what, what's it all about? So I think, you know, the other thing I would talk about as being really fascinating, I'm very unresolved, honestly, Frank. Hey, just, just before you go to that, Linda, don't, don't hold that thought. I just want to say, so what you're saying is, this has really forced us to deconstruct the office as, as an idea, right? And, yes. and, and, and what is it for, right? Is it, is it yeah. to make sure everybody's lined up? We know they're there. Is it, to, is it so people can easily connect? Is it, is it you know, to, you know I, I think that's just a really, really, there's, there's so much about work life that like we just take for granted. This is the way. And your point, that last point you made, I have a young friend, 30 something working in Silicon Valley. And she, um, you know, she ultimately went to remote work before the pandemic, but at some resistance from 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 her team. But she yeah. said, you know, they'd have an office full of people ten feet apart who who talked. They were using Slack all day. Nobody like got up and talked to each other. They were all using instant messaging, and whether they were ten feet away or you know fifty miles made no difference. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, one of the things I, I talk about is that. We have to, as you say, we have to deconstruct work. And there's, there's various ways you can do that. The way I've done it is to say, you know, there are some tasks you do which really require a lot of energy. There's some that you do that requires focus, the sort of jobs that you and I do, Gary, because we're both writers, highly focused tasks. There's some which is very much about coordination, you know, the sort of work you see at IBM or at TCS, where you're working in huge teams or coordinating all the time. And there's some which is about cooperation, where you actually need to be pe with people doing you know, face to face stuff if you can. Interestingly, the group that I'm most excited about at the moment are the architects. So then my next piece of work and research is with architectural practices, some of the biggest ones in the world, because they they are at the heart of the reinvention of the office. And I think it's a really exciting time for them. They've always thought about offices just in terms of space. But but now, of course, we're asking, well, if people do come into the office, and I think people do want to, then what happens whilst they're there? So the, the word that I'm using a lot at the moment, Gary, is intentional. We have to design work in an intentional way. So eight hours of Zooms, which is what most of us have now got, is completely ridiculous. And so are eight hours of, uh, you know, alone time in a, in a cubicle in the office, right? So they're both bad, bad, bad outcomes. But, you know, I wanted to I wanted to pick up on what you were saying about network and, and ties uh, and the, the, the fact that people in a remote environment work um, mostly with, you know, immediate teammates. And I'm sure you're familiar with that Microsoft study that came out last fall where they surveyed, well, they analyzed the interactions between about 60,000 people working at Microsoft over six months in 2020. And what they found is that um, uh, remote work uh, uh, caused the collaboration networks of these workers to become really static and siloed. So there are very few bridges between teams, right? And the, and the weak ties, which, as you mentioned, in the book are all about exploring and, and generating novel insights and, and, and opportunities, those those withered. And, and so what do you think needs to happen to the way work is designed, whether, you know, irrespective of modality, you know, because maybe there are things that we can do online to, to enable weak ties, but what, what needs to change in, in how we approach work um, so that you know, that, that level of collaboration and serendipity and connection is, is, is encouraged, uh, you know, whether it's in the office or outside. Yeah, I think this is a great question. I, I would go back to this word intentional. I think you've got to ask yourself, what is it I want to create? Um, I, I was really interested very early on to be connected with uh, a company uh, which is called Artemis Connection, which is entirely virtual and it's been virtual before. The pandemic and this is a question i asked them you know how did you create any sort of uh, serendipity and so on and they had a whole way of doing that i mean you know and, and i talk about that in the book actually because it's so completely fascinating i think you know one of the things i'd say is there are there are tasks where it's really good to be with somebody like cooperation where you you want to brainstorm some ideas you want to have great great uh, ways of thinking about things and that's that would be great if that happens in an office, which is why if you look at the architectural firms at the moment, they're talking about building offices, which are much more 
about deep cooperation. But you see, having said that, well, you know this, Gary, because the last HBR I wrote, which was about managers, I wrote, I wrote with Diana Gerson, who just stepped down from IBM. Gary introduced us. Gary, Diana and I, who wrote this wonderful piece, which I thought was really creative, we have never met. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? So I think, you know, I'm a little bit torn at the moment with the idea that, you know, it is great to meet face to face, but actually also realize that the sort of technology we've got doesn't enable us to do amazing things online. You know, your hackathons, um, the work that we do in HSM, where we were just about to put uh, in, in one of the major banks, 30,000 people together speaking their own language. So each one is going to use their language and they'll communicate. To, I mean, this is astounding. So I think on the one hand, you've got to really say face to face is amazing. We love it, but it is a high value activity. And we have to also realize that the sort of technology that's being being built now allows us to to relate to each other pretty well. So I'm sorry, I know that that's not an easy response to that important question. What I love about the position the three of us are in at the moment, and, and many of, of our listeners, is that this is an experiment, you know, and we need an experimental mindset and we need to think about this constantly. We need to keep on talking about it, raising some of the big questions that you've raised. Very, very well put, Linda. And I would just say that maybe to be a little bit provocative, that maybe modality is a little bit secondary, that, you know, you know, in a way, uh, what what really matters is how you design the organization, the work, and how decisions are made, and how power is allocated. Because I'm also reminded of you know uh, Linux, and you know which is the an open source uh, software project that has been in existence since the 90s. You know when technology wasn't as high high fidelity as it is today, and they were able to couple together a community of 16,000 people who have created the most uh, you know powerful and ubiquitous operating system in the world, right? And they didn't do that because of the technology, and they did that remotely, as you say. Uh, it can be done just the way you 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 were able to collaborate with Diane. But you know they have a common purpose. They have a governance system that allows people to make decisions in 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 ways that are collaborative and the reward you know real contribution and you know the right kinds of behaviors. And so it feels like you know focusing on modality and whether you know the the plan of an office is is almost like you know it's it's an easy thing and maybe it's something that you get your head around as an executive that i can control that i can specify that but it's almost uh you know the tip of the iceberg what you really should be doing is that profound rethinking and re-engineering of, of of the management processes inside of the firm i totally agree i mean that's why i called the the book redesigning work because of exactly your point that uh, and in fact, I've said on, on lots of occasions, it's not just about should we be in the office or should we be working from home? It's a deep question about how do people work and how is, as you say, how is power allocated? You know, the big issue right now is when people are at home, how do you decide whether they're working or not? How do you look at productivity? How do you look at purpose? So I agree, it's raising a lot of important questions, which you and I have been asking for a long time. But I, what, what I like about about the book, Linda, and 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 you're you're really forcing people just to drive this point home, to decompose work into different sorts of activities that require different patterns of collaboration, focus, uh, communication, and so on. And and I think a lot of the discussions so far about remote work have been kind of unsophisticated. It's like, well, we'll let people be be at home three days and come in two days. Well, that's like a one size fits all. That's not a very, but but I, I wanna I wanna talk about the, the the word you used of cooperation, and and maybe I, I will talk about say you use use the word co creation. Because where I've always been skeptical, and I, I'm rethinking my thoughts here, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I've always been quite skeptical about the ability to do truly creative work, co-creative work remotely. And I, I remember years and years, like 20 years ago, sitting well, at, at a meeting next to Nathan Mervold, who at that time was the chief technology officer from Microsoft. And I said, Nathan, the problem with a, with a personal computer is the P, personal. I said, we are social creatures. And when all of the work I was doing at that time, bringing hundreds of people together in rooms and brainstorming and covering walls with stickies, I said, you know, there, this is so unscripted. There's so many real time connections happening with almost zero latency, building on one, one another's ideas. 
I said, I don't even know how to make this happen when like people are staring at a, at a, at a, at a digital screen this big. And so obviously we've made some progress. We have Miro boards and Padlet and all these kinds of tools, but it seems to me that that low latency, in-person, multi-person, I don't, I still not sure you can make that happen in a virtual environment. Yeah, I agree, Gary. And I, it's been interesting actually, because as, as part of, I've gone through as an academic, you remember, do you remember the five-year reviews, Gary, when you get reviewed? And so London Business School says to me, basically, Linda, what have you been doing for the last five years? And, and I have to, I had to go back and interrogate myself and think, well, what have I been doing? And where did I get my ideas from? And it's really interesting that almost all of the insights came from face-to-face -face meetings in, in complex, you know, so for example, I'm a member of the Consortium for Adult Learning, which is something that McKinsey built years back and runs in Boston every year for a couple of days. And it brings the head of learning for the major, you know, for Google, uh, IBM, uh, it brings a social enterprise, you know, whatever, there's 20 of us there. And and actually, it's it was astounding over two days and i learned so much and you know we had drinks together and i've made friends that i still have and i agree with you now the the, the challenge is gary that what i've just described and what you've just described in terms i love the word high latency these are incredibly well orchestrated events aren't they with a stat you know with all sorts of interesting people um and i think the challenge is that and this is really your point on bureaucracy, is we just bureaucratize those and make, made them into yet another boring event. You, I mean, you've been to so many conferences where honestly, somebody stands at the front, everybody's sitting in an audience and you think, what is going on here? So it's not that face-to-face -face is great and virtual is terrible. What it is, is that if you can do face-to-face -face really, really well, it's astounding, astounding, it's astonishing, but let's do it well. Let's go back to your book for a moment. You used the word earlier, Linda, intentional, and uh, which is a good word because, by the way, most of these changes recently they weren't very intentional. They were thrust upon us by circumstances. But but your, but your argument is like, okay, well now let's like, you know, now we're having this conversation about work. Let's be intentional. Can you take us just and, and our listeners? Can you take us? You know, you have in the book you talk about a four stage approach. Uh, to redesigning work, which which makes a lot of sense to me because so much, I think, when we come to this problem, it's ad hoc, it's crisis driven, it's latest fad, it's whatever it is. You know, there was 10 years ago, I was talking about how do we build our employee brand? Well, that came and went. So talk to us a little bit about like, how how do we just build a thoughtful process for answering some of these deep questions that 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 you're raising? You know, in many ways, and this is that the, there are many disadvantages about about being sixty seven years old, Gary. But the big advantage is that you've be, we've been around a long time, and we actually started. I started as an OD person, organizational development, Ed Shine, um, all of that stuff. And and what I've done, honestly, uh, for those of you who know about uh, change management, is I've really brought that in, and I've brought the design thinking in. And, and here's the idea. You know, what I'm suggesting is we need to understand what's going on. That's the sort of first phase of all of this. And by understand, I mean, I mean three things, really. One is we need to understand jobs. I actually am putting jobs and productivity first. I'm not even putting humans first. I'm putting productivity first. Why? Because unless what we do now increases productivity and creativity, it will all be pulled out in two years' time. In fact, it probably won't even take two years. It'll take a year. So we've got to ask ourselves, what is the means by which we help people be as creative and productive as possible? Let's start with a job. I then, in terms of insight, I say, let's take a look at networks, which I don't think organizations do enough. I'm always surprised at how little conversation there is in in companies about networks. And then let's look at the people and their motivation. So that's understanding. Then, you know, the process that you love and I love, which is reimagining, you know, imagining what it, this organization could be. And then, and this I think is a really important one, and I see companies at this stage now, is, is the testing of the model. And the, and the sort of test that I've seen people asking is, is this fair? 
really important test. Is it future proofed? I mean, will this look ridiculous in a couple of years' time? Um, does it does it link to the purpose or what we want to do with our customers? And then the final piece is the sort of enacting action piece. And, and I think there's three groups that are really important. The first is the leader's narrative. What is it that leaders are saying about this? The second is team, the team leaders, the managers, who I think have, have are such an important role, play such an important role. And then the third is, you know, that they employees themselves, people like you and I. What, what, are, what are they thinking? So that, now I don't think, I haven't seen any organization except for the ones that we've been advising go through that in an orderly step. But I do think that if you haven't done one of those steps, you're going to have to go back again. You know, if you haven't thought about fairness, at some stage you go, "Uh uh-uh, this is not very fair, and you have to go back again. So, you know, my invitation to executives around the world is have a look at those four stages, play around with them, and ask yourself, am I doing them? And and if not, what's the consequences of us not taking that systematic approach yeah, and what I love about that that process, Linda, is that it's systematic, but it's also quite social, right? It's 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 a socially constructed process of change, as opposed to one that is sort of brought from the top down, as as it typically is. I have so many questions where I'd like you to maybe kind of unpack some of these elements, but perhaps before we we do that, could you uh, give an example that makes this approach come to life? Maybe pick one of the uh, uh, experiences you've had in your advisory. Um, uh, of, of this process in action and, and the impact that it's, it's had? Well, I mean, I think, to be honest, it's very difficult to talk about impact at this stage because most companies are sort of going through the process. But, but if we look at, you know, understanding, uh, one of the companies, one of the cases I write about is a technology company called Sage, software uh, company. And, and what they did in terms of understanding was a really in-depth sort of data analytics about what's going on in this organization. How do people feel? How are jobs done? How are people productive? So they actually begin began to build quite a comprehensive view about about what's happening now. I think in terms of imagination, uh, we've just seen some incredible experiments taking off. Um, you know, I talk in the book about the Can- one of the Can- Canadian investment companies that have said, you can work anywhere you want for three months a year. Wow, if you were in an investment company who wasn't doing that, wouldn't you say, wow, that's a really big deal. And especially because a lot of their most most uh, creative, talented people were not Canadian. They'd come from Spain or France or Thailand. Or, you know, so to, to actually say to somebody, to liberate somebody in that way is an astounding thing. I'm thinking about Unilever, who are just about to say, which I think is really interesting. They say, you can work for us uh, and we'll pay you a pension and we'll pay your social uh, costs and we'll pay um, your learning costs will give you access to the labor market, to the internal labor market, but you don't have to work with us all the time. In fact, you can work with us whenever you feel like it. That's really creative. You know, you probably know that in Europe right now, there's a whole bunch of companies that have said, we're going to trial a four day week. Um, so, you know, these sort of imaginations, not just about should we be in the office three days a week, but the whole question about time. Because one of the big problems about fairness is, you know, it wasn't fair at the beginning that if you happened to do a cognitive job, you could sit in your, your home. And if you were like my son, and you, I know you know this very well, Gary, uh, your, your brothers, and he was on A&E, he's a, he's a doctor on A&E, um, he couldn't sit at home all day. So, you know, we had to have a conversation. And that's really why I said, you know, when you imagine you have to think about place and also about time. And then in terms of the testing, well, that's really what I think that's where lots of companies are at the moment. And, and I'm suggesting, and again, Sage is a great example, where the CEO said, these are my red line, lines, you know, it, it's got to do, it's got to be, we've got to design work in a way that's really positive for customers. We've got to design way, work in a way that's really fair. And, and you'll love this, we've got to design a way that builds cooperation. So those were their red lines. And then in terms of enacting, you know, there's HSBC, for example, that's that reached out to tens of thousands of people and said, how are we going to make this work? So, 
you know, it's uh, there's a lot happening. I feel I don't know how you you guys feel. I've never been so excited about the experimental mindset because, you know, Gary and I over the years have encouraged companies to do experiments, but it was you, you know we've got everybody experimenting. It's just an avalanche, and I think our job, our the th you know the three of us, is to keep on narrating these experiments and to hold CEOs accountable and say, why aren't you doing this? Now, it may be that they come back and say, look, it's not going to work at all. Fair enough. But he, he, we, that's the conversation we need ha to have right now. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. Hire is the world's leading appliance company and also a global leader in the Internet of Things. For the last decade, Hire has been leading a remarkable revolution in management. It has proven that even the largest, most complex organizations in the world can be entrepreneurial at their core. Now, back to our conversation. This notion of experimentation, I know it's, you know, uh, for you, it's a, sec a second nature as is for Gary. But, you know, I, I you met, and you mentioned McKinsey before. I, I was at McKinsey for, for o over a decade. And uh, whenever a new... Uh, organizational change, you know, was uh, unrolled uh, at, at a client, like major, major shift. It was piloted only after basically 95% of it was figured out. And you wanted to, you know, maybe understand, you know, you know, just uh, soften up maybe the edge, rough edges, you know, and, 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 and make sure that, uh, you know, it was, it was all ready to go. Uh, so, so that's the level at which they were thinking about, you know, testing. And what you're saying is that no, no, no like we, we actually have some basic ideas, guidelines of things that we need to make sure or boundaries, right, in which we need to stay inside. But then uh, we need to be, we need to try things that may not work, and that's okay, right? And so it's a completely different mindset that I think is still alien or very unfamiliar, or very uncomfortable with CEOs, HR departments, and others who, you know, they may have had no choice during the crisis to experiment because they had to act. But I, but I do fear that unless we change the way, I don't know, they're held accountable, they are trained, uh, you know, we may revert to the old ways of doing it, which is sort of, let's get the 95% version of this, you know, done uh, in a cloistered environment and then roll it out uh, with some minor modifications. But Michele, you know who's, who's holding them accountable, don't you? Their employees the great resignation, that's who's holding them accountable. And I find that really, really exciting. That, and that was, you know, when you asked earlier about what was a big surprise, I didn't expect the great resignation. And honestly, because I've taken notes, I know that nobody else did, because if they had, I would have written the notes months ago or a year ago. We didn't expect it. And yet there is a great resignation. And any time I talk to a senior person from anywhere in the world right now, that's what they're talking about. You know, people don't want to join. When they join, they're leaving. And that's who's holding, that's hold, that's who's holding people accountable. I was talking to um, a, a, a couple of people from Microsoft in, in California uh, yesterday, yesterday evening, my time. And they said, you know, we've now come to the conclusion that we're going to act by learning. You know, we, we don't know what the outcome is, but we just want to be constantly in action and constantly learning. And I think that's, you know, that for me is the best possible way forward right now. That's a very positive attitude shift. You know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos at Amazon said once, he said, if you, if you, if you know it's gonna work in advance, it's not an experiment. <laughs> so, oh, but if, you, if yeah. you're willing to try something that may fail, you know, but, you know, let me go back for a moment to your point, Linda, about, you know, people are surprised by the great resignation. I, I you know, I, I suppose we were all surprised. Uh, you know, we gave people a bit of a safety net uh, through the pandemic. They got different sorts of government support. And, and, and a lot of them suddenly had the space to say, hey, maybe there's a better job out, out, out there. Uh, and, and maybe the time to do it as well if they were if they had been uh, laid off. But what shouldn't have been a surprise is the huge number of shitty jobs that were out there and the huge amount of dissatisfaction. You know, you, you talk about in the book, and I, you know, it's a very fair point. You talk about the executive in the big house with a beautiful uh, garden and, and domestic help and so on, really not being very connected to the lives of the people on the front lines and therefore may be surprised when you know, as, as, as the old uh, American country western song put it, take this job and shove it. Uh, 
But when people got the opportunity, they did that. So, yeah, I think it's a bit of a surprise. But but what shouldn't have been a surprise was how dissatisfied so many people were with their lives at work. Well, I think, you know, we haven't changed the the way that we work since the Industrial Revolution. You know, the Industrial Revolution, which started up off here in the UK, where people moved from their communities into factories uh, and worked for a period of time in a shared place. That is how we designed work. And really, we've never moved from that. And so, you know, the it's it's it is so ripe for change and you know gary you've been saying this for, for decades i feel the same as well and this is our ap opportunity you know everything has now changed and you know i talk in in a couple of my books about this notion of the possible self you know i'm a psychologist so one of the things we psychologists talk about is the fact that each one of us looking into the future has possibilities and i agree with you gary i think that that during COVID, there was a lot of inner journey work. You know, people ask themselves, who am I? What, what is it I want to do? They change their skills, they change their networks, they change their habits, their behaviors. And, uh, you know, I thought, it, I may, when I started making notes to myself at the very beginning of the pandemic, we thought then it was six months. If you remember, we thought it was six months. And I thought, I think six months is going to be enough to change people's habits. We're now two years. And habits have absolutely changed, and yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to do all the things that we've wanted to do. But by the way, I do think there's one of the questions that a couple of journalists asked me at the beginning beginning was what's best practice, and I said at the time, and I'm pleased I said it. I, there isn't such a thing as best practice. What you have to do is to find your signature, you know, find the thing that works for you. If, for example, you know, you're the head of Goldman Sachs and you want, you say, I want everybody in the office, you know, 10 hours a day, that's fine. I mean, I, I never have a problem with that because you're, you're saying what the deal is. And if you don't want the deal, don't join Goldman Sachs. It's not as if anyone's telling you you've got to join. But other companies like the investment company I spoke of are saying, Actually, that's not the deal for us. We, you know, you can work anywhere you want for three months a year. So I think you're going to see a lot more variety, which will be great because yeah. people will. Well, have it's a certainly choice. great for employees because, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to have a lot, you know, there's a lot more choice of, yeah. you know, what, what fits with me, where in the past, like it was it was pretty much a cookie cutter. You know, Linda, yeah. let me, I, I want McKinley to bring up a little data that he has because, you know, the question that, that both of us have for sure. You know, you, you've painted a fairly optimistic picture about companies that are more experimental, you know, have, have kind of done their internal journey work, really thinking hard about this. But, you know, when you look at history, um, you know, top down power structures, bureaucracy has a wonderful way of re reasserting itself, you know, it, after crisis wanes. Right. I remember going through the financial crisis. In fact, we were, we were tracking this. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, you actually saw like like the bureaucratic employment decline, you know, number, number of managers decline, we cut out staff, people, whatever. But within a few years, all that was back on the on the same trajectory. So, so you know, and we've had these conversations before about managers needing to become coaches and flexible work. So do, do you have any of that that you want to throw up there, McKinley? Maybe go a little deeper there for a moment or two. One thing that your listeners need to know that I, I am resolutely positive. <laughs> and, and Gary, you're not resolutely as positive as I am. I mean, I get criticized for being too positive. I know that. Well, you know, I, I, I see Peter Drucker, you know, uh, 30 years ago saying that by now we'd have one third the number of managers and half the number of layers. And it went exactly the other way. So, I mean, I'm... I'm optimistic for sure, but I'm not naive about what it may take to change it. So go ahead, Michele. So this data is United States data, and Gallup has surveyed uh, employees and, and asking them this question, you know, my organization cares about my, my overall well-being. And what's been really interesting, since you, you mentioned the great resignation and, and the pandemic, is that, you know, there's been a, a surge, you know, during soon after the, the lockdowns began uh, of, of people feeling grateful about the, the concern that the company was had for them. But it, it, but it looks like this this concern was short lived. Right. And, you know, and now we're in 2022. They just did this survey again, I think, January or February. And we're now to numbers that are lower than they were in 2019. And so, you know, I mean, again, this is not, uh, it's just one data point, but if you even look, you know, Gallup has other other uh, 
uh, uh, pieces of data. They, they, they've run, uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, a, set, uh, a set of surveys around job, to assess job quality, asking questions like, you know, my opinions count, seem to count at work. I'm empowered to take risks, you know, to create jobs. I feel respected as an individual. And these numbers, you know, didn't get any better. Uh, and they're and they're lousy. So you know, one out of five uh, non-managers feels their opinion seem to count at work. And I would sort of stress the seem. Uh, you know, with, with numbers like that, you know, you could have the best technology system in the world to, you know, collect insights from your your your, your employees. But if they don't feel like their voice matters, you're not going to get much, right? And so, um, so that, anyway, so that's maybe the countervailing, or maybe uh, you know, uh, something that we need to keep in mind is that while we do have an opportunity, there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and it's not like technology by itself is going to 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 steer us towards, you know, uh, 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 Nirvana, right? Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say related to that, Linda, is that I still remember in the, uh, maybe this is even before the financial crisis or, or around that time, in the early 2000s, when people were celebrating companies, you mentioned IBM, IBM, they, they were doing jams around innovation, around their values, where they were polling for two days or a day, uh, hundreds of thousands of people and even external stakeholders and bringing them together um, to you know, identify new opportunities, to coalesce around a new set of values that needed to be enshrined in the company culture and so on. And, and people thought this was gonna be the norm because now we have the technology that allows us to do that. And, and those things have, I don't know, like you, you do that with your consortium. We do that with our clients, but they certainly are not the, the norm. And, and, and it just makes me wonder, like, why, why is that the case? So why are these, despite the, the, these opportunities that are ahead of us, why are we, you know, not moving the needle as much as we could? Yeah, I agree. And, and it, it is really disappointing. And, and I, I mean, I think all of us here are very excited by the way you can bring, you know, large groups of people together to ask them important questions about innovation and so on. It is really disappointing. I mean, as I said earlier, I've been really disappointed that companies haven't done more work on networks. networks. They don't know, know enough about social capital. And those are not those aren't sort of philosophies. Those are basic di disciplines, you know, basic skills. In fact, I'm just writing something today where I, again, this is for an HR journal, said, saying, please learn how to learn how this stuff works. And I think we as educators have to take some responsibility for that, that we haven't had the impact that we would have hoped on encouraging people to use, you know, the connectivity that you, the co-creational processes, Gary, that you were speaking about earlier, that more companies don't do that. And I, I agree with you. It's, um, it's really disappointing. And, and, and I'm disappointed by that and disappointed with myself that I haven't been more influential on that. Well, I think, you know, to, to build on Michele's point a little bit, and it's kind of an argument we make in our book in, in Humanocracy, it, it seems, and, and I, I won't bring up, I have a slide here, but I won't bring it up. But you know, again, <laughs> I'm also 67, Linda. And one of the, one I know of the you are, Gary. Being, you and I are the one, same one age. One of the benefits of being this august age is you've you've seen a lot of shit that people have tried, right? You've seen a lot of experiments through the years, and you can go back and remember, you know, high performance work teams and quality of work life and job sharing, and uh, you know, self organizing teams and 360 degree reviews and blah 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 blah. And, and now we have, you know, remote work and flexible work as, as a, you know, a, a more recent one. And two years ago, it was all agile teams. But, but what's been interesting is we keep trying all these things, but really nothing changes in the, in the core data about how satisfied people are at work. And so you start to ask, okay, is there something deeper? Is there something fundamental in how we view human beings at work? That, you know, we keep trying this stuff and, you know, we've, we've called it kind of like, you know, uh, putting a tutu on a dog, right? We can you can dress a dog twenty different ways, but it's still a dog, right? It's never going to be a ballerina or a fashion model or a you know or whatever. And so you wonder, is there something deeper going on here where we're still looking at human beings as resources? Um, you know, we still look at them as factors of production. And so the the question I've had is, well, flexibility is a huge benefit for sure. But if what I really am after at work is dignity, uh, opportunity to grow and learn, uh, equity, you talked about fairness, uh, 
uh, and community, you know, working remotely is certainly saves me some time, but I don't know that it addresses dignity, opportunity, you know, equity and so on. So I wonder if there's still something, a deeper flip that has to happen in executive mindsets, or this is just going to be one more thing we've done in 30 years of doing things that kind of comes and goes, but doesn't, you know, really shift much uh, at core. Well, let me, let me, and I, I, I so agree with you, Gary, and you know, you and I have known each other for 30 years and talked about this for 30 years. Um, so let me just put, put why I think this time might be different. Um, so this is about, what we're seeing now is about flexibility. And, you know, an organization gives flexibility, but what the individual receives is autonomy. And I think that, you know, autonomy and personal agency is really at the heart of a lot of these things. You know, if people have personal agency, they are more likely to feel dignified. They're more likely to take the opportunity to grow because they can do it in the time they want. They're more likely to feel as if they're part of a community. So I, I have a view, and I think in a way you do as well, that, you know, humans are basically desperate to grow. They're desperate to learn and the more that you can an organization can take off the constraints of like where they work and when they work and how they work the more able they are to make decisions about themselves to actually exercise personal agency so for me the one of the most important constructs here is the construct of autonomy and you know that goes back to that all that work that was done years ago on on what it is that people want they want autonomy you know being a human being as opposed to being a dog with a tutu being a human is to be autonomous uh, to make choices exactly the point you were making earlier and that's i agree with you look this isn't going to solve you know all the problems that you've identified and it doesn't particularly solve the problem of dignity because some jobs you know, it's hard to see how those are going to create dignity, but I think it does give people personal agency and autonomy, potentially. So, Linda, I think I think that's a really good point because clearly, just the ability to choose where you work, to choose when you work, that's a huge step forward. So, you know, I I, I think there's a reason to be optimistic and believe this is this is a big nudge. What one other point? You know, early on, talking to CEOs and leaders early on in, in the pandemic. One of the things that they were all surprised by was was how much autonomy people took, right? Because you know, in 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 a little crisis, power tends to move to the center. But in a big crisis, like the center doesn't know what to do, and you have to trust people to figure this thing out. And they were almost universally surprised by how fast people moved to fix the business, to stay in contact with customers, to create a safe work environment, to figure out how to get connected. And I heard comment after comment, like like. We had no idea that like people would just take this initiative, figure it out, and and hopefully, you know, that that uh, the employees having the chance to kind of dust off their initiative and use it are not going to like, you know, give give that up easily. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. That is my hope, and that's why I think it's so it's so important that we continue to hold people's you know feet to the fire actually, and that's why you know I I rushed to get redesigning work finished you know, in, in, and, and Penguin and MIT rushed to get it published because you know, if it starts refreezing and goes back to how it was, honestly, I just will think, well, how did we allow that to happen? You know, and that's, yeah, exactly. That's our job as, as people who talk but don't do to, to just to persuade people, look, autonomy, personal agency, choice, um, you know, initiative, those things are combined and giving people, and even what we've seen now in the pandemic, let people make decisions about how to work better. Well, Linda, you should maybe write a book about how you got publishers to be more agile. In getting the book out. <laughs> yeah, we've struggled with that for years. <laughs> yeah, so that's that would be that would be a breakthrough uh, for sure. Uh, but can I ask you uh, one question though, re regarding the people that don't have the option of working from yeah. home, so yeah. at, at the, I think at the height of the pandemic in the US, if I recall correctly, about 45% yeah. of, of people working were working remotely in some fashion. I think yeah. it was 20% were full-time remote um, and, and the rest was you know partially. So that leaves about more than half. Uh, so that's you know, 70, 80 million people who yeah. don't have, you know, can't Zoom to work. So are there any lessons 
yeah. uh, from the pandemic or even in you know kind of the approaches to redesign of hybrid work that that could be applied to people who who don't have that that opportunity well I, I think that was that's such an important question and and it's 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 a very real question so so here was that's why that for me was a motivator very early on to do a two by two that had place on one and time on the other so if you remember i've got a I've got a two by two matrix that says place, you know, constrained, flexible, time, constrained, flexible. So I worked with one of the big food manufacturers during COVID. I, I advised them and they had half the people in factories and half of them in uh, in offices. And I, we said at the beginning, it's not fair for people to come in the office all the time and in, to factory and see the office workers aren't there. So, you know, we had to really think about how do you also bring some autonomy to these people. Now, you can't do it in terms of place, but you can do it in terms of time. And that's why I think you're seeing, and it's 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 a much later conversation. You know, everybody steams straight into place, you know, because it's about offices and and time is much more difficult to talk about. It's too, Then you have to talk about synchronous and asynchronous time and think, people are saying, what are you talking about? So, so it's a more intentional and more sophisticated conversation, but that's really what it is. And that's about scheduling, how you schedule work. It's about how you give people time out. Um, you know, this is why these experiments in Europe at the moment about the four day work are really interesting and they're proper experiments. I don't know if you've heard about them, but there are a bunch of companies who are doing you know, proper experimental work. They're doing half the company are working five days, half of them are working four days. They're looking at productivity and engagement and so on. So it's it's really time, I think, is the next frontier, um, giving people more control over time. Well, Linda, it's always a joy to talk to you. And, you know, I, we, so, so please, you know, if, if you're serious about, if you're serious about getting your company in front of this, you know, uh, this is a great guide to it. It's immensely practical. Take you through the steps you need to be intentional and creative about redesigning work. And, le and let's hope that, yeah, let's hope that we stay unfrozen for some time <laughs> and figure out a better way before we revert to the norm. So Linda, great pleasure. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thank you so much. Thank you.